Right, welcome to our next episode of Think Like an Explorer, where we're going to be talking tech. Uh, I'm Cathy O'Dowd, Everest climber, Himalayan mountaineer, and general wanderer around in the mountains, joined by Nigel Vardy, um, Denali sufferer, and general wanderer around in strange and cold places of the world, yep. and Cindy Michelle, who's far too sensible to do any of this stuff but helps us keep our feet on the ground when we're back in civilization. And what we wanted to talk to today is about technology. Whether it's a good idea, whether it helps, why it doesn't help, and why it's all more complicated than you might think to take technology on expeditions. It's an interesting topic because just a day or two ago, we got some fairly sad news in the exploring world about Henry Wolseley, British explorer attempting to do the first solo unsupported crossing of Antarctica, which of course is something that Ernold Shackleton was attempting to do way back when and pulled back from because he didn't think it was going to work. And Henry was 30 miles, I think, short of his goal when he ground to a halt, uh, sent out a message which caused his team to call in a rescue. And despite the fact that, first of all, he had a big team backing him up um, in, in terms of communications, he had a satellite phone, they had a rescue in within 12 hours, he still died. He was not, he was not saved purely by communications. And communications turns out to be a trickier thing than you'd think on expeditions. It's not an unalloyed home run hit on your side in remote areas. And that's what we're hoping to talk about today. So, Nigel, I have a strong memory of you being missing in the Himalaya. And it was all over social media and lots of people going like, I know someone and oh my God, he must be dying out there. Tell us about that. What was actually happening there? Well, Cathy, as you say, they'd been um, having avalanches and snow. I was in the Annapurnas at the time and we just got lots of snow. We had no idea what was being reported back in the West. We had no communications. You know, mobile phones don't work up there. People couldn't get hold of me. And so as soon as it hit the press and it really did hit the press, certainly in the United Kingdom, and um, people just started, well, I'm not going to quite say making things up, but, you know, they contacted my family, my friends, they're all over social media. It was splashed across the newspapers, the local television. And mm -hmm. I think my sister, uh, my sister summed it up quite well because she's ended up being become my emergency press officer. When everything goes wrong, you ring Amanda and he said he's probably sat in his tent having a bottle of whiskey, which was absolutely true. And um, we were sat in base camp. We couldn't move. There was no way we could safely go up the mountain, so we choose to sit still, wait for it to clear. But, of course, we've got no communications back with the West and back at home and back with what's going on. And these two worlds live apart until about three weeks later, I came down the mountain, rang my parents, as I usually do, just to say, I'm fine, how is everybody, uh, to be told that, you know, we'd been part of this, this media craze for two or three weeks. Thankfully, they had been told we were safe. But it, it was just, when I looked at some of the press reports later, it was absolutely crazy. But it was just the fact we've rang your mobile and you're not on the end of it and we've sent you a, um, an email and you haven't replied to it. Well, welcome to the mountains. Well, yes, I think there's a strong assumption as we now all live in a world where we have our smartphones in our back pockets. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm up there along with everyone else uh, yeah. when I'm in the city. But the thing is, we take those smartphones out in the evening and we plug them into the wall. There's a remarkable lack of plug points in the mountains or in the polar regions. So I think it's worth reviewing what it's actually like to try and communicate uh, from an expedition. Now, we've both got expeditions in planning. Yeah. What, what communications take are you going to take and how are you going to power that? Well, for my Cathy into Greenland, uh, we're going to use satellite phones as a basic form of tech. Um, and we'll carry EPIRBs as well, purely as the last resort. If anybody doesn't know what an EPIRB is, it's an emergency device that you 
fire at the end. You know, this is really it. We need to get some help. And you just hit the button on this thing and it sends a message to a satellite. They're often used um, uh, at sea or on the poles and such. Um, and really, that's going to be it. Um, and to power it, solar panels. I mean, you will charge them up beforehand. We've got a base there with mains electricity so we can get everything powered up. But otherwise, it's um, not quite something as little as this, because this is the portable one I sometimes carry. Uh, we'll take larger panels, but we'll use them and switch them off. And we'll have times when we do comms because we don't have the battery power to leave these things on day and night. Right, so you, you have those constraints even though you actually have a base camp. Now, I'm going off to Mount Logan, which is an expedition where we don't have a base camp. Uh, six, six of us, or because we have an injury, possibly only five of us, get flown in, dropped on a glacier, and that's that. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if and when we want to get picked up, we've got to get ourselves back to that sort of flat area where a plane can land. Mm -hmm. But after that, we start moving. Uh, the camp will be moved effectively every second day unless we're pinned down by weather. Uh, so we're not taking a satellite telephone. Mm -hmm. We decided that was uh, unnecessary. We're taking what a DeLorem InReach Explorer, which basically gives us satellite text messaging. Okay, yeah. So, so it does give us back and forth, but it's a good deal cheaper. Yeah. And less complicated, requires less power. Uh, we probably aren't going to take an EPIRB. We'll probably just use the, the DeLorem as our, our way in and out. Yeah. But we've got to power that on the move. Yeah. Now, again, we have some advantages because we will leave the tents up for sort of in two-day chunks. The camp will only move every second day. So during the day we're not there, satellite um, solar panels can be laid out. And when we're moving, solar panels can be laid on top of the sleds. But, of course, let's get real. Anyone who's ever put solar panels on their roof knows they've got to be angled to face the sun. So, A, you need sun. B, you actually preferably need to be in a corner of, of the world where the sun is reasonably high. Yeah. And these, this Arctic, near Arctic stuff, wrong place in the world for the sun. Yeah. I mean, and then, and then, of course, as soon as you're moving and your sled is going in the direction I need to move, it's not being orientated to the sun all the time. It's even worse. Yeah, I think the thing is, Kathy, that if you put them, my experience is if you have them on top of the sled, it's usually OK. And most of them now come with an internal battery. So you can charge that. But I think people need to understand this is not going to charge in an hour. Eight, ten at best, if you've got really good conditions and you're not in a blizzard and you're not in cloud. Now, I say my Greenland trip's got a permanent base, but we're only on it for a day and then we're off onto the ice for a week or so. So, again, We'll charge what we can. And then when we're out, we'll be using solar just to top it up. Something I've learned with bitter experience is that if you let batteries get low on a, any kind of tech and you try and start them again with solar, it doesn't work. It hasn't got the oomph sometimes to get them moving again. So you sort of let them get to 90 percent and you put them back on charge. And, of course, keep them very warm because cold temperatures and batteries are another subject altogether. Exactly. And we're still effectively both of us talking about sled driven expeditions where you can lay solar panels out on top of sleds. When I was climbing on the Mazeno Ridge of Nanga Parbat, so now this is high altitude mountaineering, the only flat space you have is the top of your rucksack. Yep. It, doesn't, it doesn't work. And uh, the rucksack's heavy enough already without dumping a, a solar panel on top of it. And these things, they have weight. Oh, yeah. The, bat the batteries we're talking about topping up as our intermediate holding, they weigh. Yeah. And then, of course, they get sapped by the intense cold. Minus 25 at night does yeah. nothing uh, for keeping your batteries healthy. Yeah. So, so that, that's one side of it. Powering this stuff is a nightmare, and solar is not nearly as efficient as people can assume. Mm -hmm. But I think there's another technical problem. I mean, I've sat on that ridge in Nanga Parbat with a satellite telephone, but this is the old fashioned kind of keypad telephone. You know, it's not, it's not touchscreen or anything. Trying to compose a text message and then trying to get the satellite phone to connect with a satellite 
to send out that one text message, which I had linked into the Twitter account. And you know, that was an hour of my life when we actually needed to be melting water in order to drink, getting food into our systems because we've got to power ourselves as well as the tech, yeah. repairing equipment that had been damaged during the day, trying to dry out equipment, trying to get some sleep. Yeah. Sending, sending out a text message was way, way down on the list of things that were actually going to keep us alive tomorrow morning and moving again on the expedition. It's time we don't always have available. Something I found as well, Cathy, which is why my right hand is slightly shorter than my left, is having to get your mittens and your big Arctic kit off your hands to press all the buttons to drive the kit to make this thing work. And I took my mittens off to use the radio when I was rescued off McKinley. And now I know while there's another half an inch off those fingers, that was the time just in liner gloves in minus whatever it was at the time, trying to get any kind of message out. Um, I did and I lived and, and that was, you know, thankful enough for that. But you haven't got the time to operate this stuff sometimes. And, um, you know, we need big buttons when you're using big mittens or big gloves and it doesn't come like that. No, it doesn't come like that. So, Tricky to charge, tricky to use, time consuming when you may actually have more important things to do. But I think there's another problem with it, which is that all of this can go wrong. Mm -hmm. the, the, the batteries can be flat, the solar panels can have stopped working. Mm -hmm. We can be so busy with other stuff that we just don't have the time to use it. And it doesn't matter, at least to us, we're out there climbing our mountain, crossing our ice field, doing the chores we need to do. But back home is a, are a group of people who are very, very used to getting a fast reply to text messages and emails and phone calls. And we're out there doing something risky and we could be dying. And people have a level of expectation we can't always meet. Yeah. yeah. Now, I've been on an expedition. This was some time ago. Actually, I've had various experiences of this, but I had one where our base camp was just crashed by a huge storm. Our tech equipment was, was our base camp was basically rolled across a, a big glacial field. Our tech equipment went crashing to the floor. We had to come back from advanced base camp to put this, this camp back together again. And then we sit there looking at each other and going, what do we do? We've effectively vanished off the airway. And we had media sponsors who were expecting to hear from us. Yeah. What are people going to do, given that we've suddenly gone silent and it's known that there's been a major storm in the Himalaya? Mm -hmm. Are we going to go back to climbing or are we going to start trekking to the nearest place where we think we can get onto someone else's tech system to send a message that basically says, we're OK, don't panic and for God's sake, don't send a rescue? And, but that was going to be serious. That was going to be four or five days of climbing across a 6,000-meter col to get to some teams on the north side of Everest. We were trying to do a new route on the east side of Everest. Okay. That was going to sink our chances of doing what we were there to do. Disappearing from contact is now a problem. Yeah. So, so what are you saying to your people at home about what it means if you stop answering messages? Well, I don't tend to tell the world. Um, I tend to obviously tell my direct family and some close friends. And frankly, everybody else will just have to wait, in my view, Cathy. When, when I went disappearing up Annapurna, I came back and, and at the time, the internet in Kathmandu was about as fast as ever. And, and I logged on. And of course, there's all these messages, you know, has anybody heard from Nigel? We've heard this about Nigel. Does anybody know about it? And thankfully, my sister put a post on and tagged me in just to say, Nigel's fine. He'll be in touch when he's ready. And and I, I came back, put a post up, got loads and loads and loads of people going, thank goodness you're alive. And and my view was, why? I mean, not in that way, but it wasn't that dramatic, really. But of course, the press and the media and everybody else jumps on the back rack and it's all very dramatic. But um, what I will do is everything I've done, because my parents are still supporting me and, you know, uh, they're still very close, they're just down the road from me. So it will be mum and dad, I'm going to ring you from the last place I can get service and I'll ring you when I get back to it. Don't expect anything in between. And I'll tell them it'll be two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, but I'll call you when I get down. And that's what I do. 
of course, with Annapurna, it was slightly different. It was, okay, so you just made the front of every paper in Britain and the vine and, you know, this has been interviewed by this and blah, blah, blah. Cost me a bunch of flowers. But, you know, we, we cannot be plugged into this thing permanently. We are there to explore. We are there to climb an adventure. And at times that does not involve being attached to the Western world via Bluetooth. <laughs> Right. Um, I see a man of your generation, Nigel. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it is. It's absolutely uh, generational, Kathy. It is it because is. there's a there's now a level of expectation of communication, yeah. uh, which is much higher. A lot of cases we're using it uh, for the sponsorship that's helping to pay for a project. Yeah. In a lot of cases, we're running social media which helps our careers in in other ways sharing the, the our adventures you know feeds into other things we choose to do yeah uh, a lot of us are, are running social media because it's fun yeah it's a great way to share a story an unfolding story in real time but i think it's a real problem how we manage people's expectations when you vanish and on the Mazena Ridge expedition we vanished when the going got really tough and we all of us disappeared for about a week and it was a dangerous week it was the time in which the guys were going for the summit and then fighting for their lives to get back down again uh, and it's it's very tough on people who are on the outside I think there's a responsibility for us to try and make it as clear as possible to people that broken communications doesn't mean disaster. Uh, no news is good news normally. Yeah. Uh, bad news tends to travel once it gets out. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you and I and everyone else are carrying comms uh, for safety. You're carrying an EPIRB. We're, yeah. we're, you know, we're carrying the Delorum. We are expecting to make an effort to call in a rescue. Yeah. You've had your life saved by calling in a rescue. Yeah. But I've been in the situation, I was now at the base camp, well, at the closest village, at the base of Nanga Parbat. Two climbers descending from the summit of Nanga Parbat, very, very close to the, the end of their tether. They call in from above 7,000 meters on a slightly odd conversation that goes like, um... How possible would it be to get a helicopter to us? To which the answer is, it's not possible. The flight height is 6,000 meters, and you sound like you're way above that. Yeah. Uh, how possible would it be for the Sherpas to you know, drop by and drop off some food? It's like, guys, you're well above 7,000 meters on a route the Sherpas have never seen <coughs> on the other side of the mountain. No, not happening. Okay. Well, I'll call you back in a bit and tell you what we've decided to do. And then they vanished. They never called back. And the battery had died. And they kept on climbing. And they ran and ran into some climbers from the Czech Republic. And it all worked out okay in the end. But I was left stand, sitting there at the base going, what do I do? Mm. Uh, I can't call in a helicopter rescue, but I can try and get a team of of. Pakistani climbers together uh, to get up to them. What do I do with this inconclusive piece of communication? Mm -hmm. Do I set a rescue in motion? Do I go back to drinking tea and wait for them to turn up and then they die? And I get a media firestorm about how could you have left them up there in that condition, you know? Um, we put together a, a, a group of, of Pakistani high-altitude porters to go up and try and find them. And they weren't pleased. They came down on their own two feet and they were not amused that, you know, a possible rescue had been called because they were fine. It's like, yeah, guys, thanks. <laughs> that was not... So it's awkward. When do we expect people yeah. to start making an effort yeah. uh, to, to go out there and start looking for us? I mean, what's your take on that? As you say, this is a real toughie. This is why when I do some of these trips and we have call-in days, we try and just give people an idea of what's going on and what we're going to be attempting. But I think you took the right call, Cathy, because you're absolutely right there. You can't get a chopper up. Believe me, I've dangled under one at 6,000 metres. It's not fun. Um, <laughs> really? Oh, flying through the air under a chopper, waving away as you go. It's, it's a hilarious evening, really. Um, 
but you've got the trouble is we are in a society now where we feel the need or the must to do something the days of cook going across into the pacific and not being seen for two years are gone you know, exactly. now, now people will make calls and it's on your conscience they've gone they've disappeared why you start questioning why and and my view is i'll make a call every every thursday or every other day if we're using sat phones or whatever it happens to be but i'll not say to people if i don't call in every three days and i miss a day wait till i've missed two you know you work with mountain rescue teams and and they'll say often when i climb in scotland if you don't report back tonight we'll not come out till tomorrow morning we don't we don't just run up the hill just in case you're half an hour late we wait till tomorrow morning so be prepped to stay the night if you have to and then we'll come out at light and we have to take this kind of choice because we're so we're so easily jumped now you know we have tickers on our screens that tell us breaking news we're almost conditioned into this we've not heard anything what we're we going to do and i just think if i'm going to do calls with, with the Greenland trip, because we're using sat phones and it's a race, we have to call in every evening. That's part of the mm -hmm. call. And if you miss a call, then they'll start asking questions. And if you miss two calls, they'll probably start looking, coming out on skidoos to find you. Um, we set those rules down straight away. We won't be calling somebody in Britain or Iceland. We'll be running it in country. And that's the advantage when you've got a base camp that's solid with comms. But when I came off McKinley, it was a terrible message we got down. And they could have said, well, it's only static. It doesn't matter. But they knew what to listen for. And that's what saved my life. I think that has to be a key element of it. Your, there must be, there should be someone at home who has been tasked with calling in potential rescue mm. and they've got to be given a certain leeway obviously they, they they're going to have to make a call and it might not be the right one what you can't have is just anybody who's vaguely concerned about you assuming that they can call in and mount a rescue yes yeah. because there are some issues around rescue that we need to be really conscious of one of course is that the people coming out on the rescue are being put at risk to Very try and help right. you yeah. And, and rescuers are prepared to do that. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's part of why they're involved in that world. They're almost always adventurers in their own right. But we don't do that lightly. Mm. Uh, but there's also a financial issue. Mm. If someone calls in a rescue, a rescue team is sent in to find people who are absolutely fine going like, what's the problem? Why are you here? Sorry, our batteries died, not, not our fault. Mm. Someone still has to pay for that rescue, and it's unlikely to be your insurance company. Oh, yeah. They are not going to be amused. Not sure to And then, no, then now who's going to do that? The person who jumped the gun to call the rescue, the team who are out on the mountain, is the rescue team supposed to eat up the costs of that? Rarely messy. Mm. So they, they need to be one or two people who kind of have the authority to call in a rescue and everyone else can call up them and be worried at them. Yeah. And they may have to be talked down. Um, <laughs> and, so, I know, Kathy, oh, from, from my perspective, I've actually taken that role in the UK before for people mm -hmm. where they've said, can we use you as an emergency contact? Um, I think purely because sometimes it would help to have a contact who has had some experience in the mountains or on the sea or wherever it might be, because they might just have a touch more of a level head than ringing somebody who doesn't know and will just fire the alarm bell straight away. You know, we've not heard anything. Crikey, here we go. Let's get things moving. We might be thinking, well, let's try something else. Let's talk to somebody in country. Let's see if we can get some more data. Then we'll take a choice. So... That's an interesting issue and one that uh, explorers have to think through before they do projects. But I think there's, there's other stuff coming out of modern communication. There's definitely a generational shift. Yeah. I think that younger adventurers are more and more interested, expecting to, committed to being in daily contact. And that can have potentially interesting implications for the dynamic of the group. I mean, I've seen, even with the slightly more limited expensive comms we've had in the past, people getting badly homesick mm -hmm. by having almost too much contact with home. You know, there are a whole lot of problems at home that are being dumped at you that you can't solve. Mm. Did it really help to know that? Mm. Uh, there are um, 
people realizing that they could be with their kids they they could be you know in the comfort of the house they they're hating the expedition more and more as they're reminded what they're losing on a daily basis but i think this it is an even more tricky transition that's coming i mean i've been on an expedition where we had massively bad team dynamics and there was infighting going on and people were forming cliques and I can only imagine what that would have been like if each one of them was also twittering their unhappiness to their following of, you know, their, their, their thousands of followers. Yeah. Or going on Facebook to go, I think my team leader is an utter idiot and here's why. And then getting their, you know, the, the, the follower hate team to, yeah. to you know, get, get their opinion going in the Twitter sphere. Yeah. I haven't seen that play out yet, but I suspect it's coming fairly soon. I've seen trips, particularly with youth groups now, Kathy, where they have social media policies for that reason. Because if you do, you know, you take some youngsters on the classic Everest base camp trek or something like that. Most of the monasteries and the tea houses now have Wi-Fi. Most places where people stay at night will have Wi-Fi. And they Mm. will be posting, this is what we did today, this is where we've been. But as you say, they can start having chat conversations with people at home, which could be the person in my tent, I don't like them, or I think our leader's rubbish, or we did something really horrible today. And if you've only got to have a youngster say, I'm really scared and I'm hating this and this is terrible, and one of the parents pick it up at home, you have got a whole world of fun when you get back. Or they will then communicate that perhaps to the company you're running through who will then communicate that to you. So we've gone from Nepal across to the Western world or wherever and back to Nepal Mm. and you stood 10 feet apart. When the issue is, please tell me if you've got a problem, talk to me because we'll, we'll resolve it. We'll work it out. We don't need to go Chinese whispers across here, there and everywhere Um, when it's so easy to do because we can send messages and tell people things without actually telling anybody else. And so a a number of the companies have said, you know, we might get a phone for the trip for emergency calls only. We might have a sat phone for the trip for emergency use only, but that's all. The rest of it, you're offline for three weeks. And how does that, that, sorry, I'm getting a horrible echo. How does that go down with kids who are used to, being online all the time (laughs) it's It's hilarious it really really is hilarious in fact you've only got to do something say a duke of edinburgh award scheme trip for two days or a day a night and a day and they're not allowed to use mobile phone at all and it it, it's like taking people off a drug i mean it, it really is just quite shocking uh, to me, but to them, you know, it, it's you've taken my lifeline away. And when you perhaps uh, meet a group of youngsters, you know, right, you've done your DOV trip, um, your parents are coming, they'll be here in 10 minutes, you can use your phones now. They're just there. They're out of the bags because they're sealed up in bags. They're out and they're on and they're watching videos instantly. Um, and it, it's, you know, to my Asian generation, it's all a bit, well, you know, there is a big world out there. But when you're 16 or 17 or 18, it's a very, very different thing. As you've said, it's a big generational change, Kathy. I'm curious, does it make it a harder sell uh, to parents to be allowed to take kids on this stuff? I mean, my first ex- expedition, admittedly I was 21, was to Zaire in Central Africa. And... I vanished for six weeks and just my mother dropped me off at the airport and was like, uh, I should be on this plane in six weeks time. And that's what you get. There will be no communication from this fairly dubious country in Central Africa and me wandering off there with some guy who I actually don't know terribly well. Uh, And that was how it worked. What are parents like now? Um, I think they've changed, certainly, because when I went on Operation Rally back in the 90s, uh, we had one phone call in 11 weeks, Kathy, and, and we had letters and posts, but you picked it up after six or seven weeks. Exactly the same. In 11 weeks, I should be on this flight. Bye. And, but my, that's to my parents' generation who never made international phone calls. Now you've got parents of our age, you know, 40s or so, um, 30s in your case, of course, Kathy. Um, <laughs> right. Um, they've grown up more with digital and media. So when it is, 
and, I, and I'm going to be slightly patronising perhaps, I can't get hold of my little darling tonight. Where are they? I think they need to understand that they're going to be offline. And uh, many companies will actually not only take the youngsters, they'll get the parents in and say, right, I'm going to take your children to the deserts of North Africa. And what you have to understand is that as soon as we leave the city, we are out of comms for two weeks. Now, there's a base in the UK you can ring, but not every five minutes. And, you know, unfortunately, if there was some horrible news from home, uh, a family death or something, fine, they can get hold of the leader. The decision can be made how you want to play that. But, you know, not that the lawn's growing and, and your bike's still outside and you didn't make your bed before you left, because, frankly, we're not interested. And we will do the same back. If, if people are fine or, Lord forbid, somebody is injured, you make the call and then you take the decision from there. But it's just not every five minutes. It's, it's the age old use responsibly. Yes, I think that that makes a, a good point to wrap it up. We've got we've we've filled our half an hour and I, you and I talked about this before this, this we did. session yeah. and we could have we could have kept going. I mean, there there's still issues around this. We, we haven't even really had a chance to delve into the different kinds of tech, the tracking tech, the, the drawbacks of it. But essentially, I think like all modern tech, it's a t double sided blessing. It brings a lot to us. It brings uh, safety. It brings weather information. Uh, it brings a chance to share these expeditions in real time in a way that's uh, never been done before. I mean, we saw that with the Dawn Wall last year. Yeah. I mean, that made a uh, big wall rock climbing on El Capitan at Yosemite into a mainstream media event in a way that has never happened before. And that was about the guys being able to Instagram their way up the wall. But they were, after all, well inside the uh, United States. Uh, it's a blessing and it allows us to do a lot of new things. It does keep us safer. But it comes with a whole set of extra complications and responsibilities and a whole more, lot more things that we have to think through beforehand. Yeah. Who these contacts are, how much news we send out, how much news we choose to receive. Um, and then all the different issues of what happens when all of this comes go down and what do we expect from the people at home. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also going to be a changing challenge. Because what you and I expect as an acceptable level of low-key communication is not going to be acceptable to 20-something-year-olds on an expedition. No. And we're going to have to move our position on what we consider uh, well, the norm in this area. You know, and Cathy, imagine when those 20-somethings are 40 and they've got 20-year-olds. Where are we going to be there? But that's for, you know, 20 years' time. Well, that's an adventure for the living. Yep. Hopefully yeah. in 20 years' time we'll have... We'll, we'll be there and we'll still have opinions and we'll still be doing adventures so we can, we can be even more grumpy about how in mind. Oh, marvellous. I love being grumpy. <clears throat> right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this particular contention, contentious issue, interesting issue. I think this counts as another one in our, our expedition uh, preparation exploration sessions. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks' time with another session about where where adventure meets the modern world and what we can learn from both. Fantastic. See you then. See you then. Thanks.